Hi all, this is Once a Future Gamer and welcome to another Pokemon Challenge. Last week we took on a spooky effort as we asked the question of whether or not I could beat Pokemon Fire Red using just a single Ghastly. Check out the video if you haven't already done so. Today though, we stay in Kanto and head back to Gen 1 as I ask the question of whether or not I can beat Pokemon Yellow using just a single Lickitung. I've wanted to do this one for a while. Lickitung is a weird Pokemon. I'd say a forgettable one that somehow got an evolution in Gen 4. We've got a free 10 base stat total with good HP and defense. Special attack and speed, not so spectacular. We're mono normal, so weak to fighting and immune to ghosts. Move wise, about the only move we get via level up that is any good is Stomp. It's the only one that's 100% accurate. When some of your moves consist of the accuracy levels of Rap, Supersonic, Disable and Slam, you know you're up against it. TM wise, we get a stack of coverage. We get water moves as an option. We get ice, we get fighting, electric, ground and fire as well as normal. So that's not going to be a problem. Ice Beam, Surf, Thunderbolt and Earthquake are amongst the best. So that's likely going to end up being our final move set. Predictions. Brock could be annoying with the move set we'll have come that point. Once we start to get coverage, we'll probably not have too many issues. Maybe Koga or Sabrina will cause us some problems. Bruno might create some issues, but the rival will probably be the biggest challenge. Just the rules then. In combat, I can only use Lickitung. Other Pokemon will be needed for HMs, but unable to fight. Only Pokeballs in battle, since there's no held items in this gen. And no glitches or exploits. If you do enjoy what you see, like, subscribe and ring that bell. There is one huge benefit to doing this in Pokemon Yellow, and that is not having to agonise over what starter to replace Lickitung with, given that we can only do it with Pikachu. I tried replacing the rival's EV once, but the game won't let you do it once it starts. I was going to originally nickname the Lickitung Cunnilingus, but there's a few things wrong with that, so I'm going to go for Slobber instead. That seems fair. We begin with Rap and Supersonic, so I figure we'll be okay for the rival fight because moves like Rap are insanely broken in this game. On the subject of that rival fight, his EV is faster but just fails with Tail Whip repeatedly, which has to be a bit of a blow to his ego as on the first turn we land a 5 hit Rap that weakens it severely. He goes for another Tail Whip clearly underestimating the danger that he's in, and we get the chance to finish it with another Rap. Rap stunlocks the opponent and in this game, and if you can combine it with Poison or Burn, it is massively deadly. Anywho, we explore and train for a bit before I decide to go and face him on Route 22 when we're level 10. He's added a Spearow to his team and it hits us with Growl on the first turn, which is a little annoying, but we just keep trying to stomp it. We get clipped with two pecs, but it doesn't cause us a mass of distress. Easy no sand attack though, and this move is often lethal on single Pokemon runs. We miss a few stomps on it, but it doesn't really try to attack us, going for a few tail whips, some of which fail. We never really look like losing versus Eevee, even if it does take a while to win, and eventually it does go down. Through the Viridian Forest I go before I head into Pewter City and the fight with Brock. I think we will be okay here, it's probably just going to drag out for a very long time. I get to level 15 and learn Disable ahead of Brock, so that might be useful when his Onyx decides to bide. This doesn't go as gruellingly as I figured it might do. We can 4 hit Geodude as we spam Stomp over and over on it, getting a flinch on the very first turn. All it does is try to tackle us, and Slobber is bulky enough to swallow those without an excess of damage, so that's pleasant. Geodude can be irritating, so it's nice not to have to worry about it. Onyx, though, is faster than us, and that's worrying when it comes to moves like Bide. Our stomps do decent damage, though. I do fire a supersonic at it, and we do get quite a bit of confusion luck, as it hits itself over and over. I do go for Disable a few times as well to waste turns when I think it's going to go for Bide. As the fight drags on though, we get it into knockout range and I go for Broke, stomping into it to give us the win. That was a good performance, let's see how we can push on now. 
In Mount Moon, I fight my way through until I can get a fossil, picking one of them up and then heading for the exit. I have to fend off the rabid Clefairy population as I do so, but once I get to the exit, I have to fight Jesse and James as they challenge me. It is pretty much a rout as we stomp on Ekans to down it very quickly. Meowth is faster and lands a scratch, but we down it with another stomp to flatten that cat. Coughing is last and it is tougher, it survives stomp, but we do get the flinch and can duly end it with another stomp without running the risk of being poisoned. They then go blasting off again. First thing I do in Cerulean City is go and fight the rival on Nugget Bridge and I'm ready for it. His Spearow does outspeed but goes for Leah rather than Growl and we down it with Stomp. Sandshrew goes down to Watergun thanks to the TM I got in Mount Moon. Ratata lands a crit on us that does minimal damage ignoring the defence drop. Crits were damaged in Gen 1 like that. We Stomp on Eevee, it hits Sand Attack but we Stomp on it again for the win. I decide to go and challenge Misty immediately after to see how we match up. I think we should be okay here depending on her move choices. Staryu is a two hit with Stomp, but it does wipe out 10 of our hit points thanks to two tackles. Starmie is next and this thing is a lot bulkier. We hit a Stomp which crits and wipes out three quarters of its HP. Its tackle doesn't do much to us, but she does drop an X defend which means it can survive our next stomp and land Bubble Beam for decent damage. But with our third stomp, we drop it, giving us the second badge. Our next major fight is with the rival again. This time, it's on the SSN. Come this point, when we face off with him on the cruise ship, we are at a high enough level that we can outspeed him. Spearow, we one hit with stomp. Maybe he should have stayed in the air. Ratata goes down to stomp as well. Sandshrew, we blast with a water gun before we go back to stomping on stuff. And this time, we do it to his Eevee. Up next, we have the Electric Gym and the most hated puzzle in existence. I get that out of the way and set about facing Surge and his supercharged Raichu. Now this thing has three powerful moves in Thunderbolt, Mega Punch and Mega Kick. So if it does hit us, we are going to know about it. We do have some bulk, but tanking blows like that could be an ask. Oh, it goes for growl three times while we stomp it to death across three separate turns. It never looks like attacking, instead being more preoccupied with lowering our attack stat. Interesting strategium, three badges down. While I am in Lavender Town, I decide to head for Pokemon Tower and tackle the rival fight in there. I figure we should have a better than decent chance at this. Once we get this out of the way, we will head for Celadon. His Fero leers at us, but we escalate that situation rather drastically by blasting it with Thunderbolt. Shelder is next, and that also gets zapped with a single Thunderbolt. Vulpix is third, and that goes down when we use a stomp on it. Sandshrew goes down to Watergun before his EV is last, and I drop a stomp on it to end it as a viable threat. I do like the rival's yellow team, I have to say. Celadon next, and it is a throw-up between the game corner and Erika. I figure I might as well go and fight Giovanni first. It doesn't really make too much difference to the context of the story. I mean, the only leaders you have to beat to open the world up are Brock, Misty for the cut HM use, and Koga for the same with Surf. Beyond those, the rest can be done in any order, barring Giovanni at the end. I fight them as I get to the cities because I'm there. Anyway, after wandering through the game corner for a bit, I eventually wind up at the fight with Giovanni. Ever notice how he never introduces himself in this game like he does in Fire Red and Leaf Green? Onyx is a one hit with Water Gun before Rhyhorn comes out next and we make it a little bit wet with our Water Gun and it goes down. Persian is last. We blast it with Thunderbolt, but it does survive and hits us with Screech and then Payday. Slobber then finishes it off by stomping on its head and we can move on. I will fight Erica while I'm here. I might as well. She is weird in yellow. Her team does reflect her anime team far more than her red or blue team because she has the second stages of the Oddish and Bellsprout line 
rather than Victory Bell and Vile Plume as she does in Red and Blue. They are at higher levels though. Unfortunately for those Pokemon, we do have Ice Beam by this point and we put the Freeze on Tangela, one hitting it with a single Ice Beam. That same move, Rex Weeping Bell, and then at the last we face off with Gloom and send it back to the Ice Age with a final move. While I'm going through Pokemon Tower, here's some Licky Tongue trivia. Originally, it was known as Tongue Tide, which makes kind of sense if you think about it. I'm like 95% certain it has the same cry as Beedrill, or close enough. Probably, its main claim to fame is being used by Jesse of Team Rocket in the anime, owned by her for 94 early episodes, but it did only appear 17 times before being accidentally traded for Wallafet. It also got that evolution in Gen 4 that nobody saw coming. It became the only Pokemon that evolves when it learns the move Rollout. I figure I might as well head to Sylph next. It's always a good place to power up and I figure it's a good time and a good place to talk about what is going on with the channel. I mentioned the Patreon during last week's challenge. Now you might have noticed if you've been watching anything that came out since the start of November that the intro to the videos has changed. You probably noticed it in this video if you're fair. I've been toying with changing it for a while. Anyway, the Patreon is now up. The link is in the description of the video along with links to my Twitter and my Discord. There will never be content on there that you have to pay for. The channel will always be free. But if you do want to kick a pledge my way to help me grow the channel, then by all means feel free. At the higher tier, there will be polls for future Let's Plays and future Pokemon challenges. But regardless, as you'll have seen at the start of this video, there will always be credit where it's due. Anyway, the week just gone. We've had two episodes of Let's Go Pikachu, episodes 21 and 22. We did have episode 2 of the Skyward Sword playthrough and episode 23 of the Fable Anniversary playthrough. I did take a break from Resident Evil Revelations 2 so that I could play and upload my playthrough of the DLC for Village. And we have actually had the first two episodes of that, with the final two being next week. In the two weeks I had off work, I did actually finish Fable Anniversary and Revelations 2, as well as getting to the post-game in Let's Go Pikachu. Next week for Pokemon playthroughs, it will be back to Insurgents, as I am taking a break from Mystery Dungeon for the time being. I do kind of want to get to the end of Let's Go Pikachu before the release of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Also, for your information, next week's challenge, I am going to do the other half of a challenge I did a few weeks back. It is going to be Pokemon Sapphire with Team Magma Leader Max's team and moves. We did Ruby with Archie's team and it's time to see how Maxi fares. As always, if you have any ideas for future challenges, drop them in the comments section below or head to my Twitter or my Discord. Rival time and this is usually one of the harder rival fights under normal circumstances due to the spike in his levels. Shouldn't concern me though as we begin the fight. Sandslash is out first and we duly shoot it down with an ice beam attack. Are you amazed I still have Water Gun, huh? Ninetales is next and it lands a quick attack before we thrash it with Earthquake. Perhaps not the safest place to do this on the 7th floor of an office building, but what are you going to do? Cloyster goes down to Thunderbolt before Kadabra confuses us with confusion. And of course, we hit ourselves a bunch of times before we down it with Earthquake. Jolteon is out last and it does hit an insipid double kick before we retaliate and hit it with an earthquake and end it as a threat. Boss Rocket is up next as we face off with Giovanni in the President's Office of Sylph. Bring on his world of pain, or so he makes the rather bold claim thereof. He begins with Nidorino and we duly smash it with Earthquake. It's probably even safer on this floor than the previous one. We hit Persian with another Earthquake and it survives to land a Screech before we finish it with Water Gun. Rhyhorn is also a one hit with Water Gun before Nido Queen is last. She's faster and hits a double kick that crits. Thanks to Gen 1 crit mechanics, it ignores the double defense drop of Screech from Persian and we can blast Nido Queen in the face with Ice Beam. Thus concludes this part of the game. I suppose we will go and face Sabrina while we're here, but I'm not hopeful. 
Her team is a lot harder in yellow than it is in pretty much any other Kanto game. So we are in for a tough fight. I think we'll struggle because they're likely going to outspeed us, unfortunately. Particularly Kadabra and Alakazam. Now, unfortunately, as I blunder around the gym trying to remember the path to her, I eventually get into the gym fight and I discover Abra is also faster. It hits two flashes, 70 accuracy move, nice, of course it does, and we miss our first earthquake before hitting the second. We take it down, but the damage has been done. Kadabra is next, and we miss an earthquake before hitting it at the second attempt and one hitting it. We were lucky that all it tried to do was recover while at full health. And then the Alakazam. Now this thing is a pain. A massive, massive pain. As we do inflict some earthquakes on it, unfortunately she drops an X defend and a reflect on it throughout the fight. So we are unable to one hit it with earthquake. And it knows recover as well. And she is not afraid to use that move. Meaning we have to keep on wearing it down. I start firing ice beams at it, hoping for the freeze. We do get hit by a psychic attack for massive damage, but thankfully, towards the end of the fight, she starts to fire Psywave attacks at us, which frequently miss, meaning that we can bring this monster down eventually. Phew! Down Cycling Road, I go and into Fuchsia City, where I immediately go and try to get Surf from the Safari Zone to upgrade our moveset. It is always a pain trying to catch stuff in this area. I do grab a few captures, but it's not like I'm bothered about getting the item finder or the experience all in this game. So, beyond the 10 I needed for the flash HM earlier and any HM slaves, there's no benefits to trying to catch a certain number of critters in this game. It's a strangely important area, the Safari Zone, in the earlier Kanto games, considering you can get two HMs here. Kinda. And yet, they got rid of it in the Let's Go and the Johto games, or at least moved it in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Mind you, the same could be said about the attitude towards the game corner and the slot machines. Koga then, let's get this fight on. He probably deserves an award or something for the most unvaried team in Pokemon Yellow, using three Venonats and a Venomoth. So, here we go I guess. At least Venonats aren't too tanky. Better them than Muck or Weezing, I guess. Anyway, as if to prove my point, the first Venonat goes down to Surf. That's so far, so good. The second Venonat also goes down to a single Surf. The third Venonat, though, is when things do start to get irksome, as it survives Surf on a sliver and hits a weak Psychic before we do finish it off. Venomoth could be terrifying as it Toxic poisons us on the first turn and then it takes about half its health in damage from Surf. That first exchange out the way, it then goes for double team, but thankfully, our earthquake lands and brings it down. Crisis averted then, to give us six badges. It's a hop, skip and a jump over to Cinnabar Island as we seek to take on Blaine. We have to go and get the key out of the mansion first, and let's not talk about the impracticalities of this situation. If the key is hidden in the mansion, how did the rival get into the gym to win the badge before us? Did he fight Blaine and then welly the key right into the balls of the mansion? Okay, that could actually have happened. Anyway, I like his team design-wise in yellow. Nine Tails goes down to Earthquake, but not before hitting us with a quick attack. Rapid Ash is a problem. How many times have you ever heard that said before? Not often would be my guess. Anyway, we get flinched by Stomp and then trapped by Fire Spin for several turns, getting stun locked. This is definitely not good. It fails to flinch us with another stomp and then we hit it hard with Surf. It survives and misses the takedown that would have finished it off with the recoil damage before Arcanine comes out. It hits a few flamethrowers on us that drop us into red health, but we are able to inflate the super effective blows that ultimately take it out. That's the seventh badge. Right then, back to Viridian City and let's have our final fight with Giovanni. Get him out of the way, and then we can head towards the Pokemon League. You know, when you go through this gym, I always wonder why there's that one random item on the floor. What's the story behind it? Anyway, I don't think we'll have a problem with Giovanni. Right up until the point where we start the fight, and we get one hit on the first turn of the fight by Fissure, 
from his Doug Trio. Son of a... That didn't go to plan, but we're totally trying that again. I believe Oko moves are based on speed in this game. So, there is a very real chance that could happen once again, since Dugtrio is one of the fastest Pokemon in Gen 1. It is joint fifth, with Alakazam to be precise. Only Electrode, Jolteon, Aerodactyl and Mewtwo are faster. Anyway, this time Giovanni goes for his signature move and uses a guard spec on his Dugtrio, and we one-hit it with Surf. Persian is out next, and it's another guard spec as we hit Thunderbolt. It survives and goes to Fury Swipes before we down it with another Thunderbolt. Nido Queen out next is a one hit with Surf. Nido King does hit us with Double Kick and then survives Surf, which is irritating as we get kicked again by the big purple dinosaur before we do take it out. Last is Rhydon, and that thing really doesn't survive Surf, as we get the final badge and head for Victory Road. Before we can get there though, we have to make it through a final fight with the rival before we can enter the Pokemon League, and at least he shouldn't have any Oko moves, so that's something. We do get attacked by two ambitious monkeys as we walk through the patch of grass, but then we're ready to go versus him. Sandslash goes down to Surf. Execute is next and then we take that down with an ice beam before he next goes for nine tails. It is faster than us and lands ember but we earthquake it. Cloyster is a one hit with thunderbolt before Kadabra is out next. That goes for reflect and then survives earthquake on a sliver. It goes for recover and survives thunderbolt on red health again before once again it goes for recover and this time we knock it out with earthquake. Last is Jolteon, who paralyzes us with Thunder Wave on the first turn, and then it goes for agility when paralysis stops us from attacking. Nothing like pressing your advantage, huh? A single earthquake takes it down though, and we win that fight. Through Victory Road I go, and as I enter the Indigo Plateau, here are our stats as we stand in the reception at level 72. We've got some solid stats there in attack, defense, and special. That speed is low for this level though, and that is concerning. We've already seen on several occasions how we get outsped sometimes, so I think that there is reason to be concerned. Moves, we've probably got enough coverage for the time being that we will be okay in that regard. All that's left to say is, it's time for you to take your guesses on whether I can do this at this level or not. Now, Lorelei is first, and I guess we'll have to see how we do here. I think we'll be okay, as long as we avoid getting frozen. Some of her Pokemon are tanky, so I think one hitting them might be an issue, particularly Dugong and Lapras. I'm right about Dugong. We blast it with Thunderbolt and it survives, only for her to drop a Super Potion on it. Something I'm somewhat convinced is an illegal move with the way that she did it, but it does make me feel less bad about having to use that extra power point to knock it out. Cloyster is a one hit with Thunderbolt when it comes out, and Slowbro goes down in the same fashion. Jinx is fourth and surprisingly fast, it hits a Thrash which we shrug off before ending it with Earthquake. Last up is Lapras, and I'm proved right once again. We hit a Thunderbolt which it shrugs off and hits a Body Slam, which doesn't affect us too badly before we finish it off with another Thunderbolt. Now that could have gone a lot worse. Bruno is next, and you would think that given how he trains fighting types, that there would be cause for concern. You would think that, yet in reality, it's nothing quite so problematic as his first Pokemon, the Onyx, goes down to Surf. Hitmonchan is out next, and that also goes down to Surf. I'm surprised by that because normally Hitmonchan has decent special defence, but I guess the special stat in this game went off its special attack. Hitmonlee hits a Mega Kick before we take it out with Surf. That well-known stab fighting move of Mega Kick, sarcasm intended. Machamp is a two hit with Surf, but hits a Strength in retaliation, but nothing too major. Weird move choices. The other Onyx, not really worth talking about. Agatha is third, and this one could possibly be a dangerous fight, because I think some of her Pokemon will outspeed us for sure, and anything can happen then. This fight is irritating, as fights with Agatha can be. 
We call for Earthquake versus the first Gengar, but she switches immediately into Golbat, who misses Toxic, which would have made this fight go very differently indeed. We blast it down with Thunderbolt. We take that Gengar out with Earthquake before the Haunter comes out next, and we then do the same thing. There is a missed Hypnosis in there somewhere, which is also a relief. Arbok is a one hit with Earthquake, before Gengar number 2 puts us to sleep with Hypnosis and then confuses us while we're asleep. We also get hit with Psychic and Dream Eater throughout the fight, as well as hitting ourselves in confusion when we do wake up after half a dozen turns, which once again is somewhat irksome. However, we do eventually get the chance to land an Earthquake and take it out, which is a big relief. That Toxic could have been deadly for how long the fight lasted. Mind you, that comment's erroneous because if we had been poisoned, it wouldn't have been able to put us to sleep, so... Meh. So, Lance then. I'm actually not worried here, but I have said that before. Most notably, last week in the Fire Red with a single ghastly run, and I've been forced to eat my words before. Still, we do have one thing here that we didn't have in last week's run that will give us an advantage. You know what that is? It's Ice Beam. We face off with Gyarados and Julie drop it with Thunderbolt. The Twin Dragonair are out next and it is a very, very simple matter to one-shot both of them with a single Ice Beam apiece. We outspeed them, which is something I'm relieved about to be sure. Aerodactyl is faster than us and it does hit a Swift, but we down it with Surf before Dragonite comes out and misses Thunder Something I'm sure that has never happened to anybody in the Pokemon universe before, ever. We hit it with Ice Beam and it goes crashing down to give us that win. So, it's just the rival left in the final champion fight and I am certainly feeling very confident. We've not had too much trouble with the Elite Four, so I think we should be okay here. I could use Alakazam making some questionable move choices though, that would help us immensely. Anyway, the final fight begins. At least, I hope it's the final one anyway. I don't want to have to do this a bunch of times. Sandslash gets sunk by Surf, giving us an immediate knockout. Alakazam is harder though. It hits Psychic, doesn't crit, and eats into maybe a quarter of our health before it survives Earthquake, which is not good as we get blasted by another Psychic that takes us below half health as we do finish it off with Thunderbolt. Executor is next, it survives Ice Beam and hits Leech Seed, but we do take it down at the next attempt with another Ice Beam. Cloyster is fourth and a one hit with Thunderbolt before we do face Ninetales. It hits a quick attack before we down it with a crit surf. I'm always wary of Ninetales because I think it has a good special stat in this game. Last is Jolteon. It misses Thunder. <laughs> that move's proving good for me at the moment. Before we down it with Earthquake for the victory. We defeat the champion. We get what I assume is a pretty big trophy. And Professor Oak takes us into the Hall of Fame. Where a Pokemon with a huge tongue gets immortalised forever. For proving it could beat the best trainers in the region. That was interesting. Lickitung is okay for a Pokemon that people tend to forget exists. Who'd have thought it? We certainly had a tear through this region. Thanks very much for watching if you sat through to this point. If you have enjoyed, drop a like, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so, and ring that bell to get the alerts. It's good for the algorithm and it does help the channel grow. If you have any ideas for future challenges, drop them in the comments section down below or follow the links in the description of the video for my Twitter and my Discord. As we said earlier, there's also a link for my Patreon down there, as well as all my YouTube playlists. Join me again this time next week for the next challenge, Pokemon Sapphire with Max's team and moves. That one is sure to be intriguing. What's going on with me then? Nothing much to say that's not already been covered. I don't really have anything that I want to add, so I am going to leave it here, I think. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been a Once and Future Gamer playing Pokemon Yellow with just a single licky tongue. Take care now, folks. Have a great day, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye now.